joining us, um, some of our very own, and uh, we're just going to have a good time questioning them about the services that they do here at Lighthouse Health Church. Amen. All right, it's good to see you guys this morning. Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, Mark 15. Mark 15, I do, um, as all of you already know, let me just make another announcement that um, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and so um, I know that uh, we'll probably have a few more people than what we have right now, uh, hopefully. Um, hopefully you're inviting some folks to come. Usually um, the best time that people will come to church is Christmas or Easter, and so next Sunday is one of those days. So if you've been waiting to ask somebody to come to church, it'd probably be next Sunday because people are more apt to come on Easter than any other time. So, but also um, for those of you that are uh, regulars and don't forget that it's the first Sunday of the month. And so on the first Sunday of the month, we have Family Sunday with Family Sunday. Don't forget that we partake of communion. So I want to encourage you to be prepared and start preparing yourself this week um, as we partake of communion next Sunday. And um, because communion is important and communion is something that is that we don't take lightly. It's not something that's a ritual that we do here at our church. And uh, but it's a time of remembrance of the cross of Christ and what he did for us and how he gave his life for our sins. And so uh, I, I would encourage you to this week, prepare yourself as next Sunday approaches. All right. With all that now being said, Mark chapter 15, I am not preaching on Palm Sunday. I know that uh, tradition is this is Palm Sunday, but for those of you that may know me, I'm not a traditional person. Um, what I do want to do is talk about why Jesus had to die. Um, I know a lot of people will have a service on a Friday um, to talk about the cross, but um, I thought I would do that today. Um, seems that we would have the most people here today. And I think this is probably a good question that most people um, have on their mind. I want to talk about why Jesus died because of next Sunday as we celebrate his resurrection. Before there can be a resurrection, there has to be a death. Before Jesus rose, he had to die. But have you ever asked the question, why? Why did Jesus have to die. Let's read that account in Mark chapter 15. In verse number 15, we'll start there and read to verse number 37. This is one of the accounts out of all four Gospels that Mark portrays of the um, crucifixion of our Savior. It says, So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And by the way, worshipped him, meaning in mockery. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simeon of Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, Aha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking the, among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. 
Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And let me just kind of add in here, Christians, aren't you glad he did not come down off the cross? Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Let's pray. Father, I believe this is the most important message that anyone on this earth will ever hear, not because it's something of me, no. Lord, it's the message of why your son, Jesus Christ, your only begotten, had to die. Father, I pray that all of our Bibles will be open so we can see for ourselves what your word says. I pray, God, that our hearts will be open to take in everything that we see in your word. And I pray, God, that there would be no hindrance at all from Satan. God, may he not muddle the minds of those who are here who need to see this. Father, I pray for the lost. And I pray, Father, that those who have never received Christ, they've never put their faith in Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for their sins, that this morning would be that morning. I also pray, God, that for those of us who are saved and have been born again, we are your children, that, God, this message would be a reminder of what's happened. May it cause us to look at our hearts, to do some self-evaluation. But more, Father, I pray that it will cause us with deep heart, soul-filled worship of you. May we not, how should I say this, Lord? May we not tend to not see what's here, but God, reveal it to us. Holy Spirit, I need you. I'm asking you to fill me and use me and preach through me. God, I am nothing in and of myself. Please, use me this hour, I pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said. As I said in my prayer, if you have a Bible, please, you're going to want to open it up. We are going to turn to a plethora of scriptures. Um, I don't mean to do that in a way to just kind of um, have a lot, even though I want to have a lot of Bible. Um, I still remember... uh, the president of the college that I went to when I was in seminary. And I still remember to this day, uh, as we were going through preaching class, if you will, and as you would preach a sermon, then they would uh, critique you. And it was the president of the college and some of the professors and things. And and, um, I still remember to this day, he said, Tim, you always wanna make sure when you go to preach, give people the Bible, give them a lot of the Bible. Give them all the Bible that you can give them. Why? Because it is through the Word of God that our faith is increased. It is through the Word of God that God speaks. And I would rather you hear what God says than what I say. Amen? So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to get it out. We will be turning to a lot. So with that, why did Jesus have to die. As we read this account of the crucifixion of Jesus, I'd encourage you to go to Matthew and then also go to Luke, and you can also see how they describe and how they show us the whole account of how Jesus was crucified and his hands being pierced with those nails, his 
feet being pierced with the nails and the crown of thorns being put upon his head and how he was crucified there and how a Roman soldier came after Jesus gave up his spirit. He plunged him in the side with the spear and out came his, the blood and the water and the so forth. And I would encourage you to read that account. But maybe, maybe when you read that, you ask the question, why did this have to happen? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, I'm going to give you several reasons that I hope and pray that all actually come about in one massive point. But there are several reasons why Jesus had to die. And if you have your notes before you, let me give you the first one. And that one is this. Jesus had to die, number one, to satisfy God's justice to satisfy God's justice. Look in your notes, Jeremiah 9, 24. The Bible says, But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. Now you will hear it said by many pastors and today in our Western culture churches, that God is all love. That's all they talk about. God is love. And God is love. Uh, matter of fact, we know this through the word of God over and over and over that the Bible says that God is love. But I want you to understand that even though God is love, do you understand that that is just one part of God's character or one part of God's attributes? God is more than just love. As a matter of fact, I put these in your notes so you could study these and, and have these for a, a later time. But there are actually 15 of God's attributes that the Bible speaks of. And they are these. Number one, God is infinite, infinite, meaning that he is self-existing without origin. God always was and always will be. Now that's hard for us, and I don't want to kind of stick here, but that's hard for us to comprehend because in our life, since the day we were born to the day we die, or should I say to the time of comprehension, we understand that everything has a beginning and everything has an end, but not with God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, right? And even in the book of Revelation, he is the beginning and the end. But with God, there was nothing before him. He always was. And if I was smart enough to talk to you about the plurality of God... What else did we, what else was it? Zach's telling me this morning. He goes, don't forget to talk about the plurality or the simplicity of God, which I'm not smart enough to do. If I could even define that for you, it would blow your mind. Simply to say, God was and is and always will be. Let that just sink in for a little bit. But God is infinite. God is also immutable. In other words, he never changes. God is self-sufficient, meaning he has no needs. God is omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. God is omnipresent. He is always everywhere. God is wise, Romans eleven thirty three. 33. God is faithful. God is good. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is loving. God is holy. God is glorious. He is infinitely beautiful and great. And finally, God is just, meaning he is right and perfect in all he does. He is right and perfect in all he does. You see, God isn't just love, but God is also just. And what does that mean? Well, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. And look with me at verse number three. I don't have this in your notes. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, verse three. <clears throat> Notice what he says. Well, let me start in verse one. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops of the tender herb and as showers of the grass. 
For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. They are right. A God of truth and without what, church? Injustice. Righteous and upright is he. In other words, whatever God does is right. Whatever God does is just. Are you with me? God is not unjust, but God and God is not unjust, but God is just. He is always right. Matter of fact, the Oxford Dictionary defines just as behaving according to what is morally right and fair. Behaving according to what is morally right and fair. That is God. Notice in Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8, he says this, But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. God will judge the world. In Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, it says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath and the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So what does this mean that, God, that Jesus died to satisfy God's justice? Here's the thing. God will judge all sin. God will judge all sin and every sinner. Why? Because God is just. Because when we've sinned, we've sinned against a holy God. And God cannot let sin slide. For the wages of sin is death. There must come judgment because we've done wrong because we've sinned against we've rebelled we've we've disobeyed god and so god in his justness will judge our sin you see god is not just love but he is also just in that he will punish sin if he didn't punish sin he would be unjust it's kind of like we have today justices. We have the Supreme Court of justices. And they are to, when they hear a case, are to be what? Right and fair and just, right? God is right and fair and just above all. And what God will do and what God will judge us in that we've sinned, his justice must happen. Someone, by the way, Billy Graham, who was the great evangelist of our day, said this. He said, modern man does not like to think of God in terms of wrath, anger, and judgment. He likes to make God according to his own ideas and give God the characteristics he wants him to possess. Man tries to remake God to conform to his own wishful thinking so that he can make himself comfortable in his sins. This modern God has the attributes of love, mercy, and forgiveness, but is without justice. Man doesn't want to be judged and punished for sin. So he reconstructs God along the lines of tolerance, all embracing love and universal goodwill. And isn't that what we've done in the Western culture? You can hear it preached on the television. You can hear it preached on the radio. That we've made up this God that accepts all that we do. And that he is not a God of justice, but he is a God of justice because he is just. Colin Smith, he's, if you ever listen to Bot Radio, he's that guy 
um, with that accent from uh, Britain or London or England, however, uh, I don't know what that accent, whatever you call it. But if you hear him, that's him on Bot Radio, Colin Smith. He said this, he said, God's wrath is the just and measured response of his holiness toward evil. God's wrath is the just and measured response of his holiness toward evil. You want to know why Jesus had to die? Jesus had to die because God's justice needed to be satisfied. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I, 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 I think I can handle that. I've had people go, well, pastor, you know, I am a pretty good person. You see, here, here's the thing. If, if you were perfect, if you were perfect, you wouldn't need Jesus, right? And how many perfect do you all, people you all know? <laughs> That'd be your sister-in-law, right? <laughs> Sitting next to him, right? <laughs> But we don't know any perfect people because there's no such thing as a perfect person. You see, people say, well, well you know, I think that as long as I'm good enough, I'll, I'll be okay with God. And here's the problem. The reason why we say if I'm good enough, I'll be okay is because we have a problem with comparing ourselves with the other people in the world, right? Well, I'm not as bad as her or I'm not as bad as him. I haven't killed anybody. Oh, I may have done this or done that, but I'm not that bad, right? Here's the problem. When you look at your goodness, what you need to do is not compare yourself to the, anybody here on earth. What you need to do is compare yourself to the Son of God in heaven. And when you can match Him, then you're going to be okay. The problem is you never will. And you can't. You know why? Because you're born a sinner. That's why. We're all born that way. We're all born to rebel against God. You don't have to teach someone to sin, they automatically know how to do it. All kids know how to do it. Amen? We don't send them to school to teach them how to sin. As a matter of fact, we teach them a lot of time, most of the time, how to behave. <laughs> Help me, right? I don't think there's a per parent here that ever had to say, you know what? My kids were perfect. My kids never misbehaved or were disobedient, right? But they were, we know. <laughs> But here's the thing, Jesus had to die. So I want you to, to, to grasp all this, and because as I bring it home at the end, all this is going to make sense. So think about this, Jesus had to die to satisfy God's justice. Number two, why did Jesus have to die? Jesus died to take upon himself the wrath of God in your place for your sins. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Isaiah 53. Because God is just, God will punish sin, and that is his wrath upon sin. God will punish sin because he is just, and it will be his wrath upon sin. In Isaiah 53, notice with me, verse 1. You know this as the prophecy of Christ, as the Messiah. In verse 1, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and it is a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him, meaning that Jesus was just a plain, there is nothing about him that would make him stand out. We're going, that's him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Notice verse 4, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement, the beatings, all the suffering and everything that Jesus endured. For our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we ye like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many. Do you see that? By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus died to take upon himself the wrath of God in our place. We are justified, verse 11, because Jesus took our iniquities upon himself. Verse 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor. Jesus died to take upon himself the wrath of God in our place. Romans 5, 8, and 9 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. 1 Peter 2, 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Do you see this? Jesus bore our sins upon himself. He took upon God's wrath because God is just and God must punish sin. There must have been a payment for sin. And Jesus bore that upon the cross. Jesus took our punishment that we deserve for our sins upon himself. Jesus, who knew no sin, who never sinned, took the full wrath of God upon himself for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why did Jesus have to die? Because he had to satisfy God's justice. And in so doing, he took upon God's wrath upon himself for our sin. Why did Jesus have to die? Number three, Jesus died to become the propitiation for our sins. Jesus died to become the propitiation for our sins. When Jesus took God's wrath upon himself for our sins... He satisfied God's righteous judgment for sin. When Jesus went to the cross and died and shed his blood, he satisfied God's righteous judgment for sin. This is what's called propitiation. It means turning away of anger by the offering of a gift. Isaiah 53, the verse that we just read Yet it, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put to him or put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Hebrews chapter twelve verse seventeen. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And of course, of course, 1 John 4.10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, because we are sinners, we couldn't pay for our own sin. We could not take upon the wrath of God upon ourselves and survive. We must pay for our sins. You say, that's hard, man. That's deep. He is a holy God. He is a holy God, and we must pay for our sins. 
And God, and here's the great thing about grace, and here's the great thing about God's love. We talk about God's love. Here's the great thing about God's love. In that knowing that we could not justify ourselves, God gave His only begotten Son. Why? Because God loves you. Because God is love. And God gave His only begotten Son in our place, Jesus was willing to go to the cross. Matter of fact, we also understand that in the garden before Jesus was crucified, when he was there with his disciples and he began to pray sweat drops of blood. And, and in his prayer, he's saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And last year I preached on the cup at the cross last year before Easter and in that cup, Jesus knew was the wrath of God. He was about to drink when he was nailed to the cross. He was about to drink the wrath of God because Jesus knew he was taking upon himself the sins of those who will receive him as Savior. And in doing that, he knew what was going to befell him or befall him, if i saying the word right. He understood the wrath of God that was coming. And he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And as Isaiah 53 even tells us, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. He willingly went to the cross. And he willingly drank God's wrath. He willingly took upon God's wrath for our sin. He did all of that to satisfy God's justice. Jesus did all of that. Think about what this means, that Jesus in taking God's wrath upon himself was the satisfier for our sins. God treated Christ as though he was a sinner and had him die as a substitute to pay for the penalty of your sin. Now think about that. Why did Jesus have to die? Jesus died because his blood for our, our sins, his blood, by his blood, our sins are forgiven. Jesus died because by his blood, our sins are forgiven. From the beginning, when our first parents sinned, Adam and Eve, God said, the day you eat of that tree, you're going to what? Die. Judgment. Your judgment's going to be death. And they died both physically and spiritually. They broke their fellowship with God. And so we know that that sin passed down from all men, from Romans 6 tells us that, Romans 5 tells us that, that, that sins passed down upon all men for that Adam's sin. But ever since Adam and Eve sinned, God demanded that a sacrifice be made for their sins in order for them to be forgiven. And through time, God set up the sacrificial system that we read in the Old Testament that was to be followed to be done in the temple. And so people would come, they would come with an animal sacrifice. And this animal was perfect. It had no blemish. It was a perfect coat, perfect hair. Everything about it was perfect. And they would take this animal and they'd bring it before the priest. The priests would then slaughter the animal. And they would take the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat of God. And by this, the people's sins were forgiven. But by this, their sins were not forgiven forever. For every year, the people would have to come and with another perfect sacrifice for their sins every single year. And these animal sacrifices covered this sin. But when Jesus came, he sacrificed himself as the perfect sacrifice that would take away our sins forever. That's why Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, Jesus said, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Jesus himself offered himself to the Father as a sacrifice to God. In closing, I want us to turn to Hebrews chapter number 9. I want to bring this all down in this one chapter and close with this because this brings it all together. 
Hebrews chapter number 9. You understand, and I hope that you see, why did Jesus have to die? He had to die to satisfy God's justice, because you cannot. Jesus had to die because he had to take upon the wrath of God for your sins, because you could not. Jesus had to die to be the propitiation for our sins, because you could not. I hope that you understand that through this whole thing as you see this, because of your sin, you cannot. You cannot. You cannot save yourself. You cannot forgive yourself. You cannot justify yourself. You cannot make yourself just outside of Jesus Christ. And that is why he came. That's why Jesus came and died on a cross. But look with me in verse number 11 of Hebrews chapter number 9. This perfectly ex explains why Jesus came. But Christ came, verse 11, as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of, his crea of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. Our eternal purchase. Redemption. He bought those who receive him as Savior. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption. Why? 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 For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also be, also of necessity, be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Here it is, verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without, here it is, shedding of blood, there is no remission. Christ came and died so that he could be the atoning death for our sins, so that we could be redeemed, so that we could have remission of sins. And in closing, verse 23, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now, don't miss this right here. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. For who? Us. Jesus is in heaven. Why? Because next Sunday we celebrate his resurrection. Because he didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay dead for in three days later, he rose from the grave. Verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to offer, he would, he would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Don't miss that, guys. Don't miss that. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
And here's the warning. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. We will see the judgment of God. In verse 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Are you that many? So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Listen, are you the many? Because you're not the many. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, you are not a part of the many. Now think about that. You cannot reach heaven outside of Christ. You will never enter through the gates of glory outside of Christ. There is no way around him, but only through him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me, he said. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Are you the many? Have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins and by faith received Christ's sacrifice for your sins? Have you stopped trying to believe in yourself that you're good? Have you stopped trying to believe in yourself that you can make it? But have you in submission and humility, humility repented of your sins and called upon Christ to say, Lord, forgive me. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And if that is so, then he offered once to bear the sins of you. You're the many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Why did Jesus have to die? Because he had to be the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could die in our place. The only one that could die in our place for our sins. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness and all through the Old Testament, we already seen, and if you do a history uh, a search and, 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 and study that, you find that how the sacrificial system was set up, but it was always the blood of animals. The blood, why? Why does God desire a sacrifice of blood? Because there's life in the blood. And the wages of sin is death. And God said there must be a blood sacrifice. And the only blood sacrifice that can clearly, clearly, clearly wipe away, cleanse us, purify us, make us just, make us holy, is the blood of Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, we often wonder why. Why the cross? Why die at a cross? You understand that the cross was not a Jewish form of persecution. The cross was a Roman form of death. It was a Roman form of putting to death those who were to be executed. They would line up crosses and in our text in the Bible, we know that there were three crosses on Golgotha's hill and they would crucify as a form of torture. And people would hang there sometimes for over a day, two days. And if they didn't die, the Roman soldiers would come with bats or clubs and they would break the legs of those being crucified. Because when you're crucified, your arms are extended out and above your head. And when you're hanging there, you can't breathe. It is very hard to breathe. And in order to inhale, you must lift yourself up with your legs to release the pressure so that you can get air into your lungs. And so to kill someone faster, they would come and break the legs of those being crucified so they couldn't breathe and that would be their ultimate death. Notice Jesus' legs were never broken because he had already given up the Spirit. But understand that Jesus, when he was crucified, he was that blood sacrifice. For when the crown of thorns went on his head, blood began to pour out. 
when they nailed his hands to the cross, the blood began to pour out. When that spike went between his two feet, blood began to pour out. And when they lifted up that cross and it, they, they let it jolt down into that hole as his whole body convulsed, blood poured out. And that blood is the only blood, the only atoning blood that can forgive us. <laughs> How do I recover from that? I kept going, is there a cat in here? How did he get in here? <laughs> So with all that being said, do you know why Jesus had to die? Because he had to. Well, couldn't there be any other way? Couldn't God just say, okay, let's just wipe the slate clean. Everybody's forgiven and let's start all over. But think about that. He, he could. God could have said, okay, today, everybody who's left on there, I'm going to wipe the slate clean. Everyone's forgiven. You're golden. Here's the problem. We'd still be sinners. And it wouldn't take any of us long to sin. For some of us, it'd be a millisecond right after he said everything's forgiven and we'd do something wrong. You see, he had to come. He had to die. His blood had to be spilt. Because through that atoning work, we can be forgiven. And that's God's amazing love. That's God's amazing grace. Oh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. How great is his love for us. Do you now see why Jesus had to die? Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself for the forgiveness of sins for all those who will believe in him. And I just want to leave you with this one verse. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Do you know how long everlasting life is? Forever. Do you want everlasting life? Do you want to live in heaven? You're not going to get there by being good. You're not going to get there by coming to church. You're not going to get there by being baptized. You're not going to get there by reading a Bible. You're not going to get there by anything other than, right at the beginning, he who believes in the Son. Believing is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Believing is putting your whole trust, your faith, in that you can do nothing in and of yourselves, but it is only through him and only by him that your sins can be forgiven. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. That's a warning. That's a warning he's telling us. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see, Jesus did die on the cross and he did atone, make atonement for our sins. But understand that Jesus did all that for those who believe in him. If you don't believe in Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. If you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will die and judgment will come. Hebrews told us that, right? That Jesus died and offered himself once, right? And it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Then he goes on to say, read that next verse. But look what Jesus did. Look what Jesus did. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you received him as your Lord and Savior? I want to encourage you to do that today. I want to encourage you to do that today. And if you struggle with it, you said, Pastor, I just, man, I just don't understand it all and I just don't get it all. That's okay. Please call me. Well, you can't call me. 
For those of you that may know, um, I haven't had a phone in almost two weeks now. My phone mm-hmm. broke and I haven't. So if you've been texting me and calling me and I haven't been answering you, you know why. It's been two weeks and it's almost kind of freeing, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Not having a phone is kind of freeing. Um, so I haven't had a phone. I'm not sure when I'm going to get another one. Uh, probably next week, I'm sure something will happen. But um, anyways, I said all that to say you can call the church or you can email me, pastor at lighttopeka.com to get a hold of me or just pop up here at the church. But I would love, I would count it a privilege and an honor to talk to you about Jesus. Allow me through the word of God to make things clear, hopefully. Because if the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Christ, my friend, listen. Don't worry about who's sitting next to you. Don't worry about who's sitting in front of you. Don't worry about who's sitting behind you. If God is drawing you, receive Christ. By faith, say, yes, Lord. I know that Jesus died for my sins. And I know there's nothing in and of myself that I can do, but I receive him as my Lord and Savior. I don't know everything about the Bible. I don't know everything that I'm supposed to do. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do after I do this. But Lord, this one thing I know, Jesus died and he took your wrath upon himself for me. And I know his blood is the only thing that can cleanse me and wash me and make me clean. And I believe. My friend, I pray that you'll do that today. I pray you'll do that today. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, Oh, Lord, I am, I am excited about next Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. He is the only one. Out of all proclamations of religions, He is the only one that has risen from the grave. Jesus is the only one who has proved that He is who He said He was. And I am excited, Father. But, Father, I want to thank You for this time that we remember why He died. I pray, God, that this has been crystal clear in everyone's mind and eyes, that they see and know and understand why he came, why he gave his life. It was for our sins, nothing else. It was for us, for your people whom you love. I pray. I pray, Father, that they may be saved. Whoever isn't saved would be saved today. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. Thank you for how you're working in the hearts of all men and women, children, teens today. I praise you for that. And I thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Are you, uh, it's only 10 till. I've still got a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> are you glad you came to God's house today? Amen. Me too. I am so glad that you're here today. Hey, um, I would encourage you, if I could, next Sunday being Easter, I'm sure that we're probably going to have a few more people than what we have today. And um, I am so grateful that you all are here. It's so good to see your smiling faces, and it's so good to see that people enjoy and want to come to church no matter how close you have to sit to someone else. (laughs) Anybody here ever do football games? Basketball games? Any other kind of sports? Soccer? Anything? Boy, yeah, yeah. none of y'all do anything? <laughs> y'all just stay home? <laughs> it's like, so, uh, hey, oh yeah, right, we have for a year. It's time to get out. Mm, anyways, yeah, so um, we're, we're planning and looking and praying and um, our next step for this building and, and uh, we're still talking, praying would be to knock out this wall and go that way, and we would double the size of this sanctuary and have a basement and so forth. But uh, that's more prayer, more talks away. But um, we hope and pray that we continue to come and sit next to each other and continue to fellowship because, listen, I love being with you. And I hope that you love being with one another. This is a great church, not because I'm the pastor, but this is a great church. That was weak. Lighthouse members, can I hear you? This is a great church, amen? It is. It's not because of me. It's not because of our music. It's because God is with us. We're excited about that. So anyways, listen, let's stand together. We're going to do some prayer. A lot of families out there got their kids. They're ready to go. And so uh, anyways, it's a nice, shiny day. I'm sure everybody's probably cooking steaks today on the grill. We're coming to your house, amen? 
<laughs> I'll give you all the, their address here before we leave. We're headed there. <laughs> Bring them on. Make a stop at Dylan's, right? <laughs> so, but anyways, um, so good to see you guys here today. Again, if you've been trying to text me or call me in the last two weeks, I haven't been able to work. I don't have my phone it's broken. And uh, I hope to get one next week. So please call the church or email, or you can call my wife. Her number is easy, 554-5552. Very easy. All five, one, four, one, two. That's confusing, isn't it? Just remember, only one, four, one, two, five, five, four, five, five. But you can contact her. <laughs> there she is. My wife like, don't tell them that. <laughs> <She's> just, <laughs> but anyways, you can call her and text her until I get my phone, and I'll be sure to get back to you. But the best way, if you could do this, if you're a guest here today, I would love a record of your visit. If you'd fill out that guest card, drop in. There's offering boxes on the way out. You can drop it there, and I will get it today. And I'll call you sometime this week to see if we can set up a time. I'll bring you a pie. We do that with all of our guests. And if you've been coming to this church for a while and you haven't received the pie, you need to fill one of those up because I'll be sure to bring you a homemade pie. Now, don't some of y'all be Christian and lie saying you didn't get a pie. We got members that will go, you never brought a pie to my house, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs>